And good afternoon, good afternoon, and welcome to this uh, spotlight clip here with Agamenex uh, today. We are really excited to have with us uh, Amir Mersev from uh, Bayes Esports, COO and Managing Director. How are you doing today, Amir? Very good. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you so much. And also with us today is Dr. David Weller, pa partner at uh, Luberger Levant. How are you today? I'm good. Thanks, Pierre. Great to have you guys with us. And um, we have a topic today that is uh, kind of near and dear to my own heart here as a former semi-professional Counter-Strike player, but it was many, many, many moons ago here. Um, essentially, we are talking today about uh, how major iGaming operators are misled by illegal esports data providers. And this is certainly a new concept to me. And um, Amir, uh, I'd be really curious if you can just talk a little bit more about the, the concept of scraping here that we are talking about today from an esports perspective and why it is relevant to iGaming operators. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to start off there. So just just maybe as, as a quick introduction, we, we as Base Esports, we're a Berlin-based company. Uh, we're, we are also the global leading provider of esports data services. Uh, we're a partner to Riot Games to exclusively distribute their League of Legends data globally uh, to ESL Facet Group uh, as a global partner beyond the summit and so on. We cover three game titles with League of Legends, Counter-Strike, and, and Dota 2, and then we serve some of the, the industry-leading uh, data service providers themselves, kind of in return, but also operators directly. So from our perspective, we have we have a certain level of vested interest in the space, of course, to, to, to kind of uh, understand what the offerings are out there. And, and I think the, 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 the concepts that we feel everybody should be aware of is, is uh, you know, what's the official or unofficial data offering? I think just in terms of, of how this developed uh, developed over the, over the last few years isn't quite that obvious or visible to everybody. And then how, uh, especially for unofficial offerings, how certain data scraping techniques work. And I think the, 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 two, the two items to be aware of there, the two classifications to be aware of on the one side would be Kind of what we would call the the, the marketable uh, uh, approach, whereas there is an, an, an AI-based screen scraping, OCR-based solutions that are being applied to to video streams. Usually, that would apply to public streams that are avail available on Twitch or on YouTube, which then basically uh, where where a software is basically run over, or where these feeds are actually, if you're if you're looking at it in more detail, these these feeds and streams are copied to feed uh, a, a basically an AI machine learning based solution um, to extract match data. That match data is then used to produce betting odds. That, uh, that narrative in itself is flawed. I think we, we, can, we can discuss it in a little more detail. David, David can touch on that. But this is kind of what, what we see, what is being promoted to the outside world often kind of as a very technological approach to, to just taking a public feed, something that is available publicly and then turn that into a, a valuable odds feed. And that in itself, comes with, with a lot of flaws. And now the second one that, that doesn't get promoted so obviously and so publicly is, is, is just is just plain odd scraping. And this is, is, is a lot of what we're seeing in the market as well, whereas basically uh, there are leading providers such as Bet365 or Pinnacle, for example, that own the whole tech stack uh, in terms of producing their own odds, basically going from live match data that they license at, at a high cost officially and then basically turn that into match probabilities with their own data sciences, turn that into odds themselves, and then trade these odds and produce and provide them to their to their clients. Um, and this odds data uh, often is the target of scraping itself, meaning that providers just go onto their websites and, in, in, in various fashions, circumvent any safeguards that are in place, and, and then basically just scrape the odds down and then sell them as a fee to somebody else. And I think you know this is the more obvious part of of why that is not okay, um, but still kind of in this whole spectrum of all the offerings that there are in the market, it's really hard for operators to kind of see behind what's what and who's who. And this is kind of a bit of the the, the, the education that we're trying to drive. And I think also the, the reason we're speaking today. Right, right, right. So, so, so essentially, uh, to, to summarize here, um, in the last couple of years in the in the esports scene, a lot of data providers have uh, appeared. There, there are those who are kind of licensed by the uh, by the game producers uh, themselves, uh, such as Bayes Esports, for example, who uh, directly create the uh, the uh, the data and then feeds it into your partners. And then there are other data providers who then essentially uh, through AI and, and ML basically uh, scrapes the uh, data directly from feeds. Yeah, uh, yeah that's correct, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right, right, right. This is... and, and, and can you explain the difference between these like official yeah. and unofficial uh, data? Yeah, 
I, th I think the I think I think the the very basic concept and narrative, and this is also why uh, we feel it's it's still fairly new for some operators to to get the hang of what's happening and what the what the differences are, is that that this concept of of uh, of official data offerings is is fairly new. So when when Base was founded in 2019 as a joint venture partner to Sport Radar, um, we had the job to take uh, Riot Games to market. Uh, for League of Legends with their first official data offering. So this was basically the first game publisher that said, I'm aware that that uh, that betting is happening in the world and there's some integrity issues around that connected when data is being used uh, from an unofficial source, basically unvetted. Um, and they basically went out of their way to create an official data offering, which since then we're, we're distributing to the market to this day and providing forward. Then on the other side, there's somebody like the ESL Facet Group that are the the the... the uh, number one independent third-party operator of leagues and platforms, basically going to somebody like Valve and creating tournament infrastructure over the top of, of the infrastructure, uh, so sort of over, over the top of the of the game uh, IPs that you see, and then they create that data again, you know, for for example their IEM uh, uh, brands and and and, and get this to be distributed. So. This whole concept is fairly new. It's just been three, four years yeah. ago, right? So if you look at somebody like Activision Blizzard, for example, for their StarCraft games and so on, there is no official data offering in the market. Activision Blizzard is not doing this actively. Um, so yeah. in, in the sense of kind of making that distinguishing, you know, we're, we're not here to tell everybody to stop doing whatever they're doing. We're just saying there is a certain, there's a certain segment of the market that's putting a lot of effort behind providing an official data stream. And that data stream is to be used to fuel certain offerings and kind of to raise the awareness that everything that is outside of that is is, is harmful. Right, right, right. I understand. So, so David, just over to you as well. From from a legal perspective, are these practices by the uh, unlicensed esports data providers actually illegal? Like, is, are there any legal questions here that we should think of? Yeah. So, from a from a legal perspective, scraping is actually very interesting. And um, when, when we as lawyers say interesting, we usually mean it's complicated. <laughs> and um, <laughs> with data, that, that's because um, data is not protected by, by IP rights or, or similar rights. Like um, when you look at the, at the computer game itself, this, this might be protected as a software. The recordings of a match that are streamed uh, on YouTube or Twitch, these may be protected as motion pictures. But the data points themselves that are extracted from the match or from the game they don't enjoy a comparable protection. And this is why when we when we look at how to tackle these issues, we need to find some some workarounds. And they differ, of course, um, depending on, on how the on which techniques are applied to scrape data. So when we're looking at, at data scraping from a website, this this may be illegal if the scraper is circumventing any technical measures that are implemented to prevent such an such an access. They don't need to be highly sophisticated technical measures, right? Something like an overlay that is used to to prevent scraping or crawlers, that would be that would be enough. But of course, it requires that that any measures have been implemented in the first place. Um, and our experience is that not many providers have implemented these measures. And then there's fair this, enough. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's database rights as well. And to 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 put it somewhat simply, um, if if you have data, let's say odds, for example, that is collected in the database, right, which is a systematic collection of, of data, which required a certain investment to create that might be protected as a database, but it enjoys protection as a whole. So what's not allowed is to, to reproduce this database as a whole or in substantial parts, but it doesn't relate to, to um, individual data points that's in the database. So we don't, we don't often see that, that websites, in particular uh, odds providers, have actually databases because the requirements set up by case law are rather high. And then where it gets really interesting is when data is extracted from publicly available video streams. That was, uh, Amir was talking about that. So we call that uh, a stream scraping. And, and technically what's happening there is to extract data points from a video stream, the operator needs to reproduce this, this video stream on its own server, at least temporarily, to be able uh, to pull out the predefined data fields using AI or algorithms. And this, this storage, even if it's temporary, this is considered reproduction under copyright law. And this is only allowed with the right holder's consent. So if the operator doesn't have this consent, he is committing a copyright infringement. And this is actually a criminal offense in many countries. Right, right, right. So, so essentially what you're saying is um, 
the fact that uh, the the unlicensed um, data providers, the fact that they are scraping the kind of YouTube or Twitch stream itself uh, is not necessarily a legal issue, but the fact that they are storing the stream uh, temporarily on a server, that's where the copyright infringement happens. That's right, correct, yeah. Okay. And so that's, um, that's, the, that's the part where the data is obtained, right? And when, what's even harder to control is the part where the scraped data is then distributed at a later stage. So what, what we typically do is look at the advertisements of these, of these data providers, because um, what they're usually doing is, uh, is claim that they are able to offer data live or in real time. And that's plain and simply wrong, because I don't th think we have touched on this before, but uh, these streams are always delayed, depending on the tiering of the, of the match, uh, up to five or even 10 minutes. So anyone who says that he's able to provide scraped data in real time is just misleading the public. Okay, fair enough. You mentioned here earlier, David, that uh, this this is an interesting, aka complex uh, topic. So, so I guess from a legal point of view, are, are there any precedents uh, here, or is this kind of your opinion for now, so to say? Yeah, not really. I mean, the, we have case law on a European level and on a national level relating to scraping of, of websites and databases, but not related uh, to esports data, so a totally different context. Um, with esports, I'm not aware of, of any uh, precedents regarding the scraping of data itself, because that's, that's something that we, that we experience. Some of the right holders are, I don't know if they are reluctant or not really aware of this issue, but, but we don't see uh, uh, any efforts on the market in legal terms from the right holders to address this issue. So um, in fact, there are two decisions that I'm aware of. Um, this is because we obtained them for base, uh, but these relate to the advertising of of gray market operators. So that's what I said before. Um, the cases were about data providers who um, allegedly scraped this data or, or at least distributed data that was not obtained via official sources, um, but claimed that these data were live for real time or obtained from, a, from an official source. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, the court, the court prohibited these advertisements. Okay. I can I can maybe I can maybe add to that from the from the from the commercial and, and from the business side. But you know the the what what, what David addressed was esports in itself. The reason why we exist as base is that um, esports is is a lot more difficult to handle for data service providers than traditional sports used to. Traditional sports like football or basketball or whatever it doesn't change much in the way that it is, and it's fairly easy to collect. It's also underlaid in terms of any public streams because. At the core, and this is what these delays are for, you know where your opponent is standing. You have full visibility of the play field. It's not like Counter-Strike, whereas you say if it's if it's an online match, you need to delay it so that nobody knows where you're hiding. So within this, it, it forms a lot of very new challenges that neither an operator nor a content right holder is familiar with. A lot of what we're doing now here is, is really trailblazing and, and, and kind of setting these, these, these first precedents, educating the market on what technologies came alongside to solve certain issues connected to esports, but solve them in the wrong way, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I suppose as well that uh, if, you, if you scrape a stream, uh, as opposed to actually working like directly with the game uh, producer, like there's so much more data that you can... Yeah get from working directly with the game supplier as well as absolutely it's it's about it's about yeah. the data speed is the one so so again as david, yes. david says if anybody says and this this is this is also relevant at some point for operators if a data service provider is not allowed to say that they have live data for live betting if they don't get it from an official source then also the operator at some point won't be allowed to say it's live betting for esports right. if it's not right. obtained from the right source so this is how it becomes an irrelevant case in, in terms of the claims that is providing, but yes, yeah, speed is, is one 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 problem. Granularity, frequency. Um, we're seeing that you know as we kind of progress, and this is again a, a legacy topic. As betting in particular progresses, we're coming up with our own solutions in terms of engaging with an audience. Right, esports is a lot more dynamic. Eighty percent of revenues are driven by live betting versus traditional, which is more driven by pre-match. Um, then as you go along, stuff like flash markets, like really high frequency betting requires high frequency data points. We're seeing that the first of our partners saying without the data that we provide in such way, they couldn't even produce that next level of, of, of product uh, uh, innovation that, that, that they were shooting for. And then, and maybe just the, like the last part is, we, the, the, <laughs> the, the way that a lot of these cases actually pop up for us is because clients approach either our partners or us and saying, I'm missing data points. 
why are they not in there? Why can I see gold on an individual level, for example, for League of Legends? And you say, yeah, because it's not the official data stream that you're using. <laughs> Interesting, interesting. And, and, and it kind of leads me to another question here. I mean, I mean, how is it possible that it seems to, today, essentially, that the operators, many operators, many established operators are working uh, with uh, these um, uh, allegedly gray markets uh, data providers. Um, how is it that they continue to work with these uh, data providers? Are they just not aware of the uh, illegality that is taking place? Yeah. It seems to be a very new question, like a new issue. Totally. I mean, we understand that it's, it's that that these topics are not easy to comprehend, especially not on the technical level. This is why we always assume best of intentions when we go in. So we assume best of intentions in a market that's 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 hard to understand, that's in transparent in some form, and that um, uh, that that requires a certain level of, of education to to kind of go forward. So we're we're assuming that, and and you know, kind of when we get into conversations, it's usually that suspicion is confirmed especially when you go to the higher ups and the management and sea level whereas in the value chain you know these guys go out and they invest uh, in sponsorships and invest millions in terms of in terms of branding and sponsorships and millions in terms of user acquisition and then save a little bit on on using the wrong data and then basically destroying uh, kind of the, their their brand that they're that they've built up so hard it's just certainly not not in their interest so it's a very loud very intransparent market and we're just trying to find a balance of kind of drawing certain lines on the legal side, striking the right partnerships that echo the message that we have, and then kind of educate the market bit by bit. Now, to pick up on, on what Amir just said, I think um, the problem actually goes, goes much further because with tangible products, it's clear to everyone that counterfeiting, for example, is not okay, right? Um, with parallel imports or gray market with tangible products, it's a bit more difficult to explain, but at least the industry knows why this is not permitted. But I feel that with, with data, the problem is that the perception is just different because for most people in the end, it's, it's ones and zeros. How could this be a, pro a product that's worth protecting? And it's this basic understanding that's lacking, not only in the esports data market, but in the data market as a whole. Right, right, right. It makes sense. And just as a final question uh, here today, uh, of what, what efforts are Bayes making to limit this activity? And I, I suppose uh, the um, kind of follow up to that question is, uh, what do you think happens next? Like, will we see kind of a, a fall here of the unlicensed data providers? If these now are becoming legal precedents, what happens you next? Know, I think, I think, I think what's, what's happening is that, that the market itself is in a, in a consolidation phase. I think I think what's what's important for us to to note is that we're we're generally on a path of of cooperation and collaboration. We we, we see more and more data service providers or content providers kind of join the base infrastructure. So Riot for League of Legends has been a partner for three four years now. is is a partner for at least another year, and we're looking to expand beyond that. ESL Facet Group has just extended for another three years, and we're working on. A couple more uh, announcements that, that 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 we're releasing. So we're we're kind of making, we're kind of educating that part of the market as well, and trying to bring them onto one platform. And then at the same time, we're trying to streamline data access for anybody that's interested. You have, we have partners like Pinnacle or Better or Abios Cambi, Sports Flare uh, that that use that data to focus on what they do best, which is odds making and, and basically a whole betting suite of products. So we're inviting everybody to to kind of join. And, and, and work with us on that extent. We're just at the same time trying to limit, uh, you know, what, what other people's claim and, and what they do if, if it's not the reality. We understand economical pressure to that extent, but a certain level of consolidation has to happen here. So, um, you know, as we go forward, we're seeing lots of interest on the operator side. The, the education is, is working really well. We're seeing a lot of brands that, that start raising awareness on that on that part. We're, we're doubling down on that by providing basically redundant services in terms of what operators they can choose from in terms of data service providers, all of them offer odds feeds at a very high quality and, and risk management solutions and so on. And I think this is this is this is kind of the way to go about it. Like we're we're not trying to be the the one stop shop for everything. We're just trying to kind of collect and and, and, and streamline data access for everybody and then basically enable great use cases for everybody. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Amir and uh, David, for uh, giving us your time here today to explain this uh, this issue. That is, uh, it's a new kind of industry, and I suppose uh, as we go further and further, there will be more and more clarity into into this issue as well. So I'm looking forward to follow the next steps in in your guys' journey and, and on the space side as well. So thank you so that. much for today. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you Great. very much. Thanks for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us.